Hi everyone, Mr. Tobin here again, and in this video, I'm going to be introducing you to the poet Paul Durkin and his poetry. We will look at the poet's background and some of the themes and techniques that characterise his poetry. We're going to begin by looking at the poet's background. It's important to remember that although you don't get marks for simply giving biographical detail on a poet, the detail can be really important for developing your understanding of that poet's work. As we will see, there are a few biographical details that really resonate through Durkin's poetry, and to appreciate his poems fully, it's useful to be aware of them. So Paul Durkin was born in Dublin in 1944, the son of John Durkin, a barrister and a circuit court judge, and Sheila McBride Durkin. Despite being born in Dublin and his family living in Dublin, he spent a lot of time between Dublin and his father's family home in Turla, County Mayo. He has written much more fondly of his time in the rural setting of Mayo than in the urban environment of Dublin. Durkin grew up in an upper middle class family, and area, Dartmouth Square in Dublin. He has said that he has fond memories of his early childhood. He says of that time, I think, like most children, I was enthusiastic about life. I was probably too intense and excitable, and the day was never long enough. I think I was incredibly trusting and naive. There was, however, a hint of a troubled relationship with his father. In an interview in 2007, Durkin said, my father used to say to me from as early as I can remember that, Nemesis will follow you all the days of your life. She was the Greek goddess of bad luck, and sure enough, he was right. Then, from the age of around 10, his relationship with his father deteriorated further. He says, When I was 10, he began to be somewhat problematic. When I think about it, there were gratuitous beatings, and he was incredibly severe about things like examinations. If I hadn't gotten second or third place, it was bad news, and sometimes he would take the strap off his trousers and beat me. A man has to be so very complicated if he takes a school report for a 10 year old that seriously. There was also the issue of Durkin not fitting the expectations that were put upon him. Again, he says, From a fairly early age, I was aware that certain kinds of people disapproved of me, particularly certain kinds of males. These men had the idea that boys had to be soldiers, chaste soldiers, and had to fit into a mould, and if they didn't, there was something not quite right. My father would say, Paul is a sissy. Come on, be a man. I was aware of his deep disapproval. Durkin, however, had a much warmer and less formal relationship with his mother. He talks fondly of her spirit and her laughter. His mother was a niece of Maud Gunn, who was the muse of W.B. Yeats and an Irish social and political activist. And her uncle was John McBride, one of the leaders of the Easter Rising, which began the Irish War of Independence, leading to the foundation of the Irish state. Durkin has written about how he never fitted in with his family's middle-class way of life, and his attempts at rebelling and asserting his individuality reached a terrible climax when he was studying law and economics at university. His family, concerned at his behaviour, had him forcibly committed to a psychiatric institution, St John of God in Dublin, and later a Harley Street psychiatric hospital in London, where he was subjected to electroconvulsive therapy, or ECT. And this is the treatment where electricity is applied to a patient's head in an effort to jumpstart or reset the wiring in their brain. He was also treated with medication. All of this, Durkin says, was because he didn't conform to his family's middle class views and that to his father, anything a doctor said was sacred and couldn't be challenged. Eventually, Durkin ran away and lived homeless in London. Throughout all of this time, he was writing poetry and it was when he was living homeless that he heard that his first book of poetry was going to be published. Durkin came to know the Irish poet Patrick Kavanagh very well and he became a sort of mentor or muse for Durkin. In 1967, Durkin, through attending a wedding with Kavanagh, met Nessa O'Neill and they married soon after. This is the Nessa that is referred to in many of his poems. They subsequently had two daughters. Durkin returned to Cork from London with his family in the late 70s and they lived there until 1984 when, after 16 years of marriage, he separated from Nessa and left the family home. He moved to Dublin, where again, like his earlier years in London, he was homeless for a time. He was poet in residence at the Frost Place, New Hampshire in 1985, and writer in residence at Trinity College Dublin in 1990. He was awarded the Irish American Cultural Institute Poetry Award in 1989, and his collection, Daddy Daddy, 1990, won the Whitbread Poetry Award. He was the joint winner of the 1995 Heinemann Award. His later collections of poetry are The Art of Life in 2004 and The Laughter of Mothers in 2008. In 2011, Durkin was conferred with an honorary doctorate from University College Dublin. Between 2004 and 2007, Durkin was the third Ireland professor of poetry. And a selection of his work, Life is a Dream, 40 Years Reading Poems, was published in 2009. And his latest poetry collection is Praise in Which I Live and Move and Have My Being, 
That was released in 2012. In 2014, at the Irish Book Awards, Durkin was honoured with the Lifetime Achievement Award. So Durkin's poetry. There are 15 of Durkin's poems on the Leaving Cert syllabus, and they span almost his entire career in poetry, from the first collection in 1975, up to one of his most recent collections, The Laughter of Mothers, in 2007. The collection around the middle of his career, the Berlin Wall Cafe, is often regarded as his most important work, and the poems we are looking at fall neatly either side of it. The first seven before, and the remaining eight poems after. The Berlin Wall Cafe also marks his first collection of poems after the end of his marriage to Nessa, and we might notice a shift in tone at this point particularly the almost painful yearning for home in the poem from that collection that we study, Windfall 8 Parnell Hill Core. So what characterises a Durkin poem then? What are the key things in his poetry to look out for? Well, there are a number of things, and let's look first at the content. As we've seen already, Durkin didn't fit in and conform to his upper middle class family's values and beliefs. He was an individual and a non-conformist, so much so that his family thought he was insane. This side of him comes through in his poetry too. He often attacks, critiques or satirises those who hold power in Ireland, particularly the Catholic Church, the government, the middle and upper classes, and those who are traditionalists and conservatives, those who show no flexibility in their thinking or their beliefs. He shows a resistance in his poetry to the Irish middle class way of life with its materialism and the hint of violence behind it. That's something that is touched on in Wife Who Smashed Television Gets Jail. A really good quote that sums it up nicely is something that Thomas Kinsler wrote in a Poetry Ireland Review article. He said, Durkin refuses the tyranny of a uniform Ireland. Remember how he said that he felt the disapproval of other males from a young age because he didn't fit the mould of what a young man should be? Well, in his poetry, he often self-feminises. He writes from the perspective of women very, very well, and some of his most insightful and provocative poetry comes when he adopts the persona of a woman or other marginalised people, those at the edges of society who don't normally have a voice. Love and loss are also very important themes in his poetry, as is honesty. There are very few contemporary poets who are so desperately honest in their poetry as Durkin is. In a country like Ireland and a society like ours, this level of honesty is not really the done thing and so it can be quite difficult to read sometimes. He talks about his family, the failure of his marriage, and other personal subjects in such detail that sometimes we feel the need to look away almost. We feel that we shouldn't be privy to such private details. Another of these private details that he discusses or references in many of his poems is sex. He has said that growing up in Ireland in the 50s and 60s was like growing up in an absolute lunatic asylum of sexuality. Here he's referring to the suppression of any talk about sex, any reference to it in popular culture, and the strict rules governing it coming from the dominant figures in the Catholic Church and the government. It's not surprising then for such a non-conformist as Durkin that sex and the erotic and the physical side of relationships appear in many of his works. Some other themes and ideas that are explored in his poetry include childhood, nostalgia, memory, family, and relationships. So those are some of the things that Durkin writes about, but what about his style? How does he deliver these themes? As you would have noticed from reading Durkin's poems on the syllabus, there is a range of styles in use. The poem Nessa, for example, is very different to Wife Who Smashes Television Gets Jail. It's more similar to Windfall, while Six Nuns is markedly different to nearly all the others. The difference here is important. Durkin adopts or takes on different personas or characters in order to explore themes and ideas. Each persona has a different voice. So for example, the voice of the reporter in Wife Who Smashes Television Gets Jail is reserved for talking about and satirizing the various social, political, and religious injustices that Durkin sees in everyday Irish life. His ironic arrangement of the facts in this poem, for example, highlights the abuse of power that happens in the poem, but also in Irish society, the powerful trampling over the powerless. These poems are monologues and dramatic in nature, almost like they're being performed. The Nessa poems and poems reflecting on his own marriage are different in tone. They are more lyrical and contemplative. Despite the differences in his poems, there are some constants that we can say are features of a Durkin poem. Durkin is a visual poet, he thinks and writes in terms of images. He has spoken of his love for painting and cinema and the visual arts, and he said that 
he sees little difference between those arts and what he does with poetry. He is arranging a series of images prompted by words in the reader's mind. He sometimes uses accessible or easy images and puts them in a sequence that is straightforward for the reader to access. But he also often challenges the reader by using obscure or difficult imagery and juxtaposing it with things that you might not think go together. This is all done to create a response in the reader to create a reaction. An interesting idea that's worth spending a couple of minutes looking at is connecting this idea of Durkin as a visual poet with something else that we see an awful lot in his poetry, the use of repetition. This is one of the more distinctive features in his poems and it appears often. So why is he doing it? Well, to begin, let's take a look at a famous British painter, William Turner. I just want to focus on a technique that he began to develop in his work towards the end of his career. At the heart of the painting, and you can see two examples here, is a swirling vortex. It is the central piece that draws in the eye of the viewer and everything else is a sort of spin-off from that central shape. If you consider the repetition that Durkin uses in his poetry, how he keeps coming back to a repeated word or phrase in some of his poems, like the word home in Windfall, or the phrase that was a whirlpool in Nessa, it's something like the vortex in Turner's paintings. It's the central anchor and through the repetition and the continuous return to that word or phrase, it grows in meaning and importance. Another common feature of Durkin's poetry is his humour. Durkin has spoken about how he attempts in his work to create a mood that is hovering somewhere between laughter and tears. And he deliberately wants us to be unsure of what it is that he intends. Take, for example, his two short poems, Enfamie, 1979, and Madman. In both of these poems, there is a childish simplicity created by the language, but the turn from the first line into the second in both poems delivers an emotional blow. In Madman in particular, we're invited to imagine for a moment that the humorous madman on the street, in line one, is actually our father and in our house. And in line two, with that blow, the humour disappears. So these are some of the common features of Durkin's poetry. It's not a fully exhaustive list, and it's important that you try to develop your own opinions and ideas about his poetry. That, after all, is the point of it. It's the point of studying such a vibrant and exciting poet as Paul Durkin. I hope that you found this introduction useful. Please take a look at the video on each of his poems and download the worksheets and quizzes to go with them. If you haven't subscribed already, then please do. And I welcome any comments, questions or suggestions.